Welcome to the Chorus One Podcast. In this podcast, we explore the emerging open financial system facilitated by scalable interoperable blockchain networks. Tune in every Monday to dive deep into cutting edge projects and protocols with Chorus One team members and guests. Hi, today I'm chatting with E. Dean Tribble, who is CEO and co-founder at Agoric. Dean, welcome to the Chorus Podcast. Thank you for having me, Meher. So I've been participating in the IBC calls for the past several weeks and the review calls. And I've interacted with Dean a lot on these review calls and I've been impressed by the depth of thought Agoric has brought to the IBC development. Thank you. So before we get into Agoric, Dean, maybe it would be nice to talk a bit about your background and how you came around to building Agoric. Sure. I'll do a little bit of background on Agoric because that's the first part of my background. In 1988, Markham published the Agoric Open Systems Papers, which obviously where we derive our name from. And that was, to my knowledge, the first big description of using software agents to create and participate in markets. And it inspired a lot of technical work since then. In 1989, I participated in deploying what we now think of as the first production smart contract. And it was deliberately thought about as being a architecture deployed as a essentially software service, obviously pre-blockchain, indeed pre-internet, but we won't go there. And American Information Exchange was a place where buyers and sellers of information and could set up consulting arrangements so that someone who was an expert could come and see a participant that wanted to get a solution to some technical problem. They wanted a particular application written. They had a technical challenge that they were trying to debug and needed expert help. In a different marketplace inside the same American Information Exchange, you could present business plans to get reviewed by the likes of Mitch Kapoor and Esther Dyson. And the arrangements were a structured contract where the execution of that contract would be enforced by the execution of software. So once I agreed to terms where part of it was expressed in English and part of it was understood by the software, once you delivered the documents I requested, it would automatically transfer money. If I disputed it, we would go into a dispute resolution process that was supported where, again, many of these steps were enforced by the software and money transferred and rights transferred by the execution of software, not by humans in the middle. And so that was the first instance that some years later, out of that whole group of folks working on, you know, cypherpunks, online markets, online payments, that sort of thing, Nick Zabo, uh, Al Finney, were all part of that larger extended crowd. Nick Zabo was able to characterize that as, you know, hey, that thing that was Amex, that was interesting. It had these properties. We should do more of that. We'll call it smart contracts. And that was at the time where, you know, smart light bulbs and smart refrigerators and smartphones was a newfangled idea. And so smart contracts were apply computers to this whole thing that we kind of do with contracts. And thus, that was sort of the origin of that work. We took a lot of the ideas for how to do that stuff, how to do large-scale distributed systems, and applied them subsequently to lots of different businesses and applications and products and companies and so forth. So you've worked at Microsoft for a long while. Mm -hmm. Were you also working on things like smart contracts in there or was it a hobby? So I joined Microsoft as part of an acquisition, a previous company called Agorix with an S, totally different company. We did large scale B2B commerce applications for the early internet. So brokerage information system for Schwab, early electronic check system with and for IBM, various things like that, cyberspace infrastructure and so forth. And so we built a secure infrastructure, and Microsoft acquired Agorix for that. And so I came to Microsoft, and initially it was for the Exchange 12 reboot of Microsoft Exchange using our security architecture and approach. But then I went into a project called Midori, where I drove a lot of the object capability architecture, async messaging architecture. And so a lot of the Midori architecture was exactly inspired by the kind of infrastructure that we were doing for smart contracts. Oh, when I mentioned Agorix, so one of the project at Agorix that was not a production system, but rather with research, was a large project with Sun Microsystems called WebMart, Sun Labs, Sun Research, where we built a ecosystem in the labs network for software agents to be able to buy and sell compute resources 
leverage the price and availability of resources to dynamically choose what network routes to use for high bandwidth network, to be able to rent time from the satellite dish on the roof in an automated fashion, and to be able to present applications to users that would use market information about the compute resources to be able to do various things. And so that was an early framework for doing smart contracts for building market-aware applications. And so that was the company that we built a lot of this technology and this security model and composition architecture for smart contract components. And that was acquired by Microsoft. Midori, we were rebuilding a lot of similar infrastructure of secure operating system with asynchronous distributed messaging and so forth to be able to do large scale distributed systems. And many of these ideas are going to come into the Agoric stack and we'll get into the Agoric stack. Absolutely, yes. Where I went to Microsoft or built these enterprise systems and then went off to Microsoft, Mark Miller went to Electric Communities, which was a collaborator with Agoric and used a lot of these ideas for infrastructure of a decentralized cyberspace. It was back in the late 90s. And they built the e-programming language that was inspired by my dual language, which was inspired by Markham's actor work. You know, so we've we sort of gone back and forth on these technologies. Yeah. And so they built that and worked out a lot of the ideas applying object capability into programming languages. And then he went to Google and started the Kaha project, which was really the first from scratch open source, from the beginning open source project at Google. And that was to bring the security elements that we knew we needed for smart contracting into JavaScript. And so since I think 2007, he was working with Doug Crockford at Morningstar and various others to drive into the JavaScript standard in the JavaScript language, the key ingredients. So, you know, strict mode, weak maps, proxies, promises, all of those things are elements that we did early development of even before JavaScript, and then Markham helped drive into the language so that we could put it together and have the ability to express smart contracts and secure composition in JavaScript. Very interesting. So I first came across Bitcoin 2011 and Ethereum in 2014. My reaction to Bitcoin was, wow, this is so amazing. This is like so novel, right? And my reaction to discovering Ethereum was, why don't bank ledgers just work this way already? Like for Bitcoin, you needed to discover sort of this, this proof of work in order to make Bitcoin work. But with Ethereum, it felt like the idea that you could have units of money, of currency, and you could write programs to manipulate them. This felt to me that this should already be part of all financial institutions, right? Like, why can't I deploy programs with my bank's ledger? Yes. And I still have that question. Like, And then you discover that smart contracts are actually old. So people were having ideas like Ethereum pretty mm-hmm. early on, maybe with different architectures. Mm-hmm. But yet you see that Smart contracts never became part of the financial system. Why do you think that is? So when we did the Agorix project at Sun Labs, the WebMart project, one of Bert Sutherland's, Bert Sutherland was the head of Sun Labs and he sponsored this project and we took over his office and he went off and you know worked out of a closet or something. No, 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 a different office. One of his phrases is, over the network, I can send you a gigabyte file, but I can't send you a quarter. So he was very focused on how do I implement onto the internet, not just technology, but business plans. And so it was exactly that question. And in some sense, you're reiterating exactly the question that we would keep asking, why can't I do this? You know, why is it hard? Why is it a problem? And there were various attempts and various forces pushing back in, right? You know, everything from Cybercash, Digicash, Eagle, Chom's work, all those kinds of things. And it just required, you know, continually tilting at that windmill until, I like Markham's characterization, until, you know, the alien from the future, Satoshi, came down and gave us Bitcoin, right? And the nice thing about Bitcoin is it was able to proceed without anything able to obstruct it. Right. There was no negotiation about its deployment. You could just kind of push it out there as opposed to any particular thing like where counter interests, whether it was monetary interests or political interests or what have you, could resist making things more accelerated. And so it was an important step forward in enabling us to do that. And it enabled us to do it with other kinds of currencies because it showed that there was clearly interest and value there. It's really interesting how like some technologies just need permissionlessness in order to be deployed. For example, my answer to why I can't deploy programs on the Bank of America ledger, it's it's Bank of America will have a regulatory headache if I do that, right? Because <laughs> I could I could deploy 
whatever gambling application on Bank of America's ledger. And it's going to be shut down if it allowed everybody to deploy programs. That's right. So maybe that's why like smart contracts never became so enmeshed with money. Whereas once you have something like Bitcoin, you can be like, okay, I can put my contracts in there no matter what application somebody might put them to. That's right. That's right. Well, and there's an irony that it's not just a permission thing, right? If Bank of America let you run arbitrary programs on their systems, then A, they have to worry about the security of that. So that's an important element. And B, they've in some sense taken liability. There's all these issues around common carrier and which, you know, which things did you actually take liability versus you get to go, no, it's anyone can run anything, so it's not my fault, right? But one of the things that having decentralized systems gave you is the ability to decouple that liability from execution in an important way. Right, So that if I deploy a gambling application on Cosmos or someone deploys a gambling application on Bitcoin or Ethereum or Cosmos, there isn't a Joe Schmo to go, hey, say, hey, hey, you're supposed to get rid of that. That's bad. Right. And we can't find the guy who did it. So we're just going to hold you responsible. And, you know, there's some value in being able to stop people from doing bad things. The problem is, obviously, that's overused and it prevents certain kinds of innovation and chills certain kinds of things. So there's an obvious important trade-off there. But having permissionless systems meant that, you know, you got the decoupling of deployment from infrastructure from liability and responsibility. So let's get into Agoric. What is Agoric? What are you setting out to do as a company? As I said, we've been doing smart contract technology for literally three decades. And to be clear, smart contracts pre-blockchain, they exist. They're out there. eBay is a smart contract. Lots of people use it. It's a contract-like arrangement between parties, the buyers and the sellers, the advertisers and so forth, that is implemented in code where the code does the enforcement. It does the money transfer. And yes, there are escapes to be able to revert things and so forth, but fundamentally, most of their transactions are automated where the rights transfer and the relationships are all managed by software. Now that all requires a trusted third party. And that's useful, that's valuable, but there's a lot of things where you could do better than that. So from my perspective, a real blockchain is something that has data and choices, ordering, you know, but fundamentally data and choices that are implemented on computers that are in multiple administrative domains and multiple jurisdictions. And what that means is no one party no one uh, uh, implementer, no one validator, no one government is in a position to compromise the integrity of that system. So they're not in a position to compromise the integrity of the data. And then when you add smart contracts to that, they're not in position to compromise the execution of that smart contract. And what that means is it can act as that trusted third party that, that, that you would like to not trust as much as you, as you had to before blockchain. And so it can provide the same level of integrity that you get with this highly replicated data. It can provide it to the execution of these smart contracts. So now you can have a relationship between parties enforced in code where you can actually rely on that to be true. So the value prop of blockchains, the value prop of blockchains combined with smart contracts is that it differentially reduces the cost of trust, right? It makes the things that were hard to do because we were worried about whether people were telling the truth and now we can have high integrity in the data. So we don't know maybe whether the data was you know, the correct assessment of the weather, but we know that tomorrow we will see the same data as we saw today and we can rely on it not being tampered with. We can rely on if there are multiple validations of something, they're all adding to the correctness and our assurance of correctness of the data rather than adding more confusion. There was a study that estimated that the cost of trust is 35% of the GDP. We're not going to be able to get rid of all of that, but that's still $30 trillion a year of opportunity to be able to not just reduce the cost of what people currently engage in, but enable them to cooperate in new ways they weren't able to do before because they couldn't rely on the interactions with pseudonymous parties, anonymous parties. They couldn't easily verify the credentials of someone either anonymously or pseudonymously or someone elsewhere, someone in Germany, in Africa, in India, where I'm trying to sell a loan product or offer an information agreement or do some consulting with a total stranger that I may never meet and never hear from again. And so all along, our vision is how can we bring online in a decentralized fashion 
the ability for more people to cooperate in more ways. You know, it's all of the structured business and personal workflows between parties where we want to enable the software infrastructure to accelerate and improve that and lead to more choices, more ability to cooperate, more general freedom across the board. And so we're building a software platform leveraging existing consensus technologies to be able to provide that, to be able to allow people to deploy smart contracts that can enforce interesting new ways of cooperating and more importantly, to be able to compose those smart contracts. So there's our goal. Our mission is enable that more cooperation. In order to do that, right, and the network is large, the, the things people use software is large, the goals people have is large, no one company is going to do that, no one blockchain is going to do that, right, there isn't going to be one winner. We need to enable millions of programmers, not thousands, not tens of thousands, but literally millions of programmers to be able to do this stuff safely. So that's our goal. And so that means, you know, a security model they can understand because it's got to be safe, you know, a language they can understand, a language they're already familiar with, or you've got this learning challenge of training literally millions of programmers to be able to do this stuff. Well, you have that anyway, but having to do a brand new language or a brand new way of thinking, you know, those are expensive, those are challenging, that just pushes out the time frame at which we can succeed at enabling these programmers out, you know, into decades rather than years. And so those are kind of the goals is what does it take to get those millions of programmers to be able to do this stuff? And a chunk of what it takes is us cooperating with lots of people, right? Our goal is mainstream use cases, mainstream developers being able to succeed at this stuff because that's what the whole crypto ecosystem needs is to be able to, you know, we've got a lot of exciting niches. We've got a lot of exciting experiments. We've got a lot of exciting evidence that there's stuff here, but it's still, even tens of billions of dollars is still a very small fraction of, of, of what we all want to be able to solve with this stuff. And so getting out to, you know, to get out of that, you need to, you need to get more developers, more companies, more customers involved. Yeah. I mean, so this is actually pretty obvious, right? So back last year, I was working with this system Tezos, right? Mm -hmm. And in Tezos, uh, the value proposition is smart contract safety. Fortunately, like when, when I start working with Tezos, I realize that I need to spend like four or five months if I'm to get Mickelson, if I'm to get right. liquidity. And, and maybe it's four or five months for me. Maybe on average, most developers learn this thing as a hobby, not as full-time like me. So maybe it's, it's a year. And if you take like 10 million developers and you multiply by one year each, so that's 10 million developer years... And suddenly that cost is actually very massive, right? Right, right, right. So what I find really interesting about Agoric is that it's just JavaScript, right? Like it's right. the language developers know. And the claim of, from Agoric is that you can write safe smart contracts in JavaScript. So I think right. like the economic value proposition is the saving of those 10 million developer years. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and yeah. maybe reduction of it to like 100,000 developer years, <laughs> right? Yeah. But at the same time, like we've been sort of conditioned to think that JavaScript is not good enough for smart contracts. <laughs> yeah, you know, JavaScript controls trillions of dollars. So yeah, we've been conditioned to think that. People are just wrong about that. I mean, you know, and some of what we do in various places is show people how they're wrong about that. But yeah, JavaScript is fine. So one of the curious elements of history and why we can do JavaScript, JavaScript is actually easier to secure than Java, C Sharp, these other languages, uh, OCaml. We've actually done those. We've done the same computational model that we have available in JavaScript now. We did it in C++, Tickle, and Java at Sun Labs. There was a thing called Joey that came out of Berkeley, which was a Java that was locked down to be able to do these reliable, composable, secure elements. We did it in C Sharp at Microsoft in the Midori project. We did it you know, in, in all these different systems. And as an accident of history, JavaScript is easier to do than that. What happened is JavaScript came out and the language standardization was done in ECMA, in the ECMA standards, International Standards Organization. And so ECMAScript is JavaScript, you know, with a standard stamp on it. But that's what everyone actually implements ECMAScript rather than JavaScript because JavaScript is trademark, right? And the web connection, the DOM and the document and window were in W3C. And then Node came out and Node was in Node.js core and the Node organization. And so the political boundaries lined up with a user mode, system mode separation that you want out of a good operating system. 
And so what that means is the language itself out of ECMAScript can be made secure and all of the platform authority, all of the platform permissions, all the platform things you could do, connect to networks, read files, change files, all that sort of stuff, those come in as JavaScript objects in the global namespace. And so because of the work of Markham and others to make sure that A, that user mode, system mode separation was explicit and maintained, and B, giving us the ability to lock down and control what would happen with that global namespace, that's what gave us the ability to define what we call featherweight compartments where I can have software that I run from random third parties, you know, Dr. Evil's Evil Emporium is my canonical example of a random third party you might want to buy a little bit of sin from, but you certainly don't want to be completely exposed to, and you can run code in a compartment, and I guess the audio viewers can't see my fanatically waving hands, right? You can run code in a compartment and give it just enough authority to do what you want it to be able to do, and it can't escape and look at your files, look at your keys, you know, connect over the internet, you know, send them there and so forth. And so there's what the language is capable of, and then there's what people do with the current environment and tools like NPM and so forth. And, you know, as with several, you know, either with Java module systems, as with Ruby module systems, as with all these others, they still have a security concern about how do you compose systems out of this that we know how to address. And in smart contracts, we're certainly addressing it. We're actually working with the Node team and others on the next gen secure module system for JavaScript so that it's easy for anyone to be able to secure this, not just in smart contracts, but everywhere else in the JavaScript ecosystem. But JavaScript is extremely well suited to be able to do that sort of thing, to lock down the world. Yeah, I think the essence of understanding Agoric is how is the sauce made? How <laughs> How is it that you have a bunch of smart people inventing entirely new languages? You have like Mikkelsen, you have like Moo, uh -huh. you have like probably like 30 languages. You have a bunch of smart people concluding that you need an entirely new programming language to do smart contracts well and it has to have these features and those features. Whereas Agoric is coming in saying, you know, JavaScript is going to be good and JavaScript combined with this objectivity security is, is going to be good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if the Agoric claim is true, it's big because there's a massive productivity saving, right? So like that is the, I think the meat of this, what I'd like to focus on in this okay. in the rest of sure. the podcast. So like from the basics, maybe we could start with the idea of like the security model of Agoric and how that security model enables JavaScript to be safe. So we can perhaps start sure. with object capability security and talk sure. about it. Yeah, yep, yep, yep. And then we can talk about what's the alternative that, if you don't mind, I'll say a little bit about what current systems do that are part of the issue. And then we can come back to that later, but it helps to have a little bit of a frame. When I come to, you know, I get a new job, I get an access to new computer systems, I get given a few privileges. I'm able to do some things. And then I get promoted or change positions and I might get a few more privileges. And that doesn't change very often. And it's all about what is Dean Tribble, the guy holding this badge that swiped it at the door and came in, what is Dean Tribble, the person I hired, allowed to do, right? So that model of security, that's the identity-based access control model, it ties what's Dean allowed to do. And it lets me, as an administrator, say, oh, Dean's this person, what's he allowed to do? Okay, I'll give him these three rights. You know, it's easy to think about, from some perspective, you know, what job roles are allowed to do what things. But it's very static. It doesn't change very often. It's not dynamic, and it's not generally programmatically controlled. And it's about the people participating at the edge. Right. Another example of just for the listeners. Another example of so this is identity-based access control, and yes. mm -hmm. it's embedded into your Mac OS or your Windows. So the first That's screen right. you're going to see is user right. one, Meher, user two, his wife, user three, guest user. That's right. Mm -hmm. And so those are three identities and I mm -hmm. need to establish my identity and then I'm going to get access to this particular piece of the operating system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's identity-based access control. I have to prove I have Meher via password and I get something that I can do. Exactly. Yep. And, you know, people are familiar with it and it is known to be inadequate. You know, it doesn't support delegation or it supports it very poorly. So if I've got a file that I have access to in my company, and I you know, am authorized to make it available to you who's not in my company, then how do I do that? Well, in something like Dropbox, you know, Google Docs, you know, all of these things, 
they actually have, you know, what will, as you'll see later, corresponds to a capability model where I can say, yes, give me a sharing link. And then I send that to you and now you can access the file. You don't need authentication. You don't need, you know, I knew who I was handing it to. I hand you access to the file and we're done. That's not the identity-based access control model. That's this new thing. But I wanted to describe the identity-based access control model because it's, the thing you certainly need at the edge, or you, you need something at the edge where I identify the person, I authenticate the person, I give them some privileges. And if a company, and that's sort of our initial best practices, and if a company screws up their security while still doing those best practices, they apologize, they pay out the money, they do whatever, and they move on. But if a company innovates on security, you know, like the target breach, you know, all, all these different breaches of data security, those were identity-based access controls, they screwed up stuff, and people got secrets, and it was all very bad, and they apologized, and they move on, and, you know, they certainly did audits and tried to do better, but fundamentally nothing was changed, and you're in the same kind of exposure where a mislabeling could have a problem. But if they innovate and do something different, and then there's a problem, that's a different level of liability. Right, And so there's a lot of reason to be very careful about innovating on security in you know, the corporate enterprise kind of environment. When we came in to look at doing Agoric, this was in 2017, where there had recently been numerous, I mean, not one, you know, not two, but you know, I don't know, not 20, but several notable breaches, notable security problems where security experts had bugs that resulted in tens of millions of dollars of losses within minutes with essentially no recourse. And so people that had been inspired by the Agoric Open Systems papers, by our promise ideas, by you know all these implementations, and knew that we had this other approach to security, approached us and said, hey, there's this problem over here in blockchain. You have this alternative solution, you know, and you've been working in this space for a long time. Maybe there's a synergy here. Can we get together and talk? And so we ended up with a panel that you mentioned Tezos. The panel was Zuko, Mark Miller, Arthur Brightman, Brian Warner, who had just completed the Ethereum security review, and Jorge from the Gravity Project. And, you know, so it was a panel where coincidentally it happened right in the middle of the Tezos fundraise. So from the beginning of the panel when Arthur was talking to the end of the panel, you know, the value of Tezos went up by a lot. And we were talking about this security model is applied to smart contracts in the blockchain ecosystem. And there were two big potential wins. One was you could get much better security, but the other that's almost as important and goes back to this, how do you get a million programmers to be able to build this stuff? is it improves your ability to do dynamic rights transfer, which is fundamental to smart contracts, and it improves your ability to make composable contracts, where I can have a smart contract, which is a concert ticket, I can write another smart contract, which is a covered call, which is a call option, and now, instead of the call option just being in terms of money, I can reuse it, I can plug it together with my concert ticket, and now I'm able to sell someone the right, you know, for 10 quatloos to buy my concert ticket for 100 quatloos as long as they do it before Saturday. Right? And that's a composition of two smart contracts that I was able to do easily, that I should be able to do easily in a framework that is challenging in the identity-based access control model. What is it about identity-based access control that's broken? So first thing you mentioned is delegation is hard. Yes. So delegation is hard because if I'm on my computer, there's some file that's locked to my user and I want to give somebody else access. I have to give that person my password, essentially. That's exactly right. Or they have to get registered, I have to find out their user ID, and then I have to grant them privilege if I'm the administrator on that file. So my comparable example is if I want to lend you my car, I give you my key, you drive off to the hotel, you give the valet the key, you go in, you come back out, a different valet gives you back the key, you drive to the repair shop, you give them the key, they give it to the repairman, the repairman does repairs, you get the car back, you come back home, etc. right? If I did that with the identity-based access control model, with the message dot, you know, that shows up as message dot sender in Ethereum, we can talk about that. But the identity-based access control model, I would have to tell my car, okay, Meher is allowed to drive the car. You then drive to the hotel, you ask the valet, so what's your name? You have their name, you then go to the car and try and enter their name in the car and you discover that you are not the administrator on the car. 
any more than if I were to change permissions on my file to say, okay, Meher can view this file. You now can't delegate it to your coworker in order for them to be able to look at it. I have to go do that. So the car, my options are leave you high and dry with my car parked and you can't take it, you can't park it, you can't take it to the repair shop, whatever, or make you the administrator. So now, not only can you authorize Joe to park the car, you can park the car, you could also sell the car. If I've made you administrator, you can now delete it, transfer it, you know, sell the car, etc. right? And that's just the wrong level of exposure. The patterns of what's easy to do authorization with, with the identity-based model, means I am typically in the delegation scenario either giving you too little authority or giving you too much authority. So if you think of like smart contracts, so my mental model is not agoric, it's Ethereum, because those are the smart contracts I've written. So if you think of an ERC-20 token in Ethereum, ERC-20 token you can imagine is, as this like glorified mapping, right? Here's an account and here's a balance, here's an account, is a big mapping of accounts to balances, and it exposes a set of functions. And I... I, as a user, can send a transaction, authenticate that I have the private key corresponding to one of the accounts, and I can order the smart contract to make some changes to balances. So that's identity-based access control, right? So I have to prove that I own one of the accounts, and then I can exercise and change the... the presumably, I could implement delegation here as well. Right. I could, as a smart contract programmer, write this additional program in the ERC-20 contract, say, hey, there is this extra function, delegate money. Right. And I could use the delegate money function to delegate access over my money to Dean Triple. Where's the problem? So it goes back to that representation question. And if you work hard enough, you could make a capability analog on top of managing a whole bunch of tables where the actual authority is the table index and stuff like that. So let's come back to that. So first, I'm going to ironically answer a question you asked earlier. What's an object capability? So there are a specific semantics of this model. So formally, you know, an OCAP, an object capability, we call OCAP, is a transferable, unforgeable authorization to use the object it designates. So how you do that in a crypto system and how you implement it in an operating system and all those things, there's lots of fancy, clever patterns for it. People have been working on this for decades in lots of different areas for doing primarily secure OSs is where this technology shows up, but also in like, you know, as I said, Dropbox and, you know, Google Doc references. But at a programming language level, that ideally shows up as simply an object reference. So I would have, instead of my concert ticket being CF8X742392, and I've got to go redeem it in some table somewhere, it would be a JavaScript object that I could say, hey, what's your venue? Can you show me a map? You know, it's got some protocol, and it looks like a concert ticket from an API point of view. And it still has identity in the same way that that unguessable token that you rendered it in has some identity. And from that perspective, dealing with tokens explicitly looks a lot like you're doing assembly language programming and you're dealing with addresses explicitly instead of being able to raise your level of abstraction and program in terms of objects. Yes, lots of systems are built that way, but it's very low level. So what you're describing in that ERC-20 model is one of the typical kinds of implementation approaches that OCAP systems use to model in the OS what's going on in terms of who's got what reference to what objects. You can do that with tables, but you are open coding stuff that you ought to be able to just say, you know, hey, Maher, here's the concert ticket. Instead of saying, hey, you know, here's the concert ticket, enjoy open paren concert ticket, close paren. I have to go, hey, concert ticket venue, there's going to be this guy, Maher, with a symbol, something or other. He's going to come and he'll prove he's that guy. And so you can give him the concert ticket. And if I think about up front, oh, and he might want to be able to turn around and resell that. So I'm going to add more complexity and code to my smart contract to enable that. Oh, and he might want to do a covered call. I'm going to add some more complexity and code to my smart contract to enable that, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. If I think of all these things you might want to do and build it in, then maybe you'll be able to do them. But if instead I have a general architecture where the default is 
It's a bearer instrument and I can transfer it to you and now you can do anything you want with it as an electronic right. You can sell it in an auction, put it through escrow, make a covered call on it, build a new abstraction around it that's gonna do something else. That's just a simpler, more composable, more extensible environment that you didn't have to achieve by open coding table management that the operating system or language auto have been doing for you. The other important thing is you can build all that ERC-20 and then you have to do all the same thing with ERC-721, but it's a different protocol. So if you wanted to have an escrow agent that could work for fungible or non-fungible or a, an auction that could get paid in ETH or in some ERC-20 token, well, now you have to have multiple code paths because they were all open coded in different ways and every programmer's open coding it slightly differently. So some of them have bugs and all that kind of thing. The value of raising that level of abstraction is A, you can get it right once, you can security test it once, you can you know review it once, and most programmers are operating in the world of the domain objects that they understand. You know, they can just send you a concert ticket instead of doing a table dance every time where the arguments passed around are not, hey, what type are you? Oh, you're a concert ticket. Great, I know what to do with that. Instead, they're all some string that you hope you remember which table that's a key in. And God knows there have been plenty of times where people had the wrong string and sent the assets off into Never Never Land that no one could recover because, you know, they sent it to the wrong place or they used the wrong ID or what have you. Yeah, so to me, the contrast seems to be that so there's this two paradigms. One is the identity-based access control is Ethereum, and one is the object capability, which is going to be the Agoric smart contracts. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In the identity-based access control, if I am the smart contract and I am authenticating all of the identities of these parties interacting with me, uh -huh. I have to implement all of the logic. So if, for example, I'm an ERG20 contract and the parties initially have the right to transfer, if I want to give some other optionality to these parties, I have to implement the logic. Okay, so delegate transfer is another optionality. Maybe, I don't know, there's something else. So there's, there's partial delegate or something like that. There's partial delegate, there's temporary access that I'm going to rent out instead of sell. <laughs> yeah. So anytime I think of some optionality to give to my users, all of the code for that optionality needs to be written as part of the ERC-20 contract. Exactly. Right? Yep. And the way I understand like object capability security is the advantage of it is that I will not need to write all of these optional features. What I will need to write, what I as the smart contract will need to provide is just some kind of capability to the user and the users can further use these capabilities to build the optionality needed. Yes, but when you say some kind of capability, again, the way that appears in JavaScript is you provide a digital asset constructed in the same kind of way that in React or Vue or one of these things, you would create a component, right? There's a framework. I'm going to create a JavaScript object. Done. That is a capability. An encapsulated object is a capability. It's a reference that if I hand it to you, you can invoke the operations on it. That's fundamentally a capability. Now, we have these levels of our system where at the object capability layer, right, that's sort of JavaScript programming where I can share an object with you. That's just JavaScript. Above that layer, we then have framework components and patterns of use in the same way that, you know, as I said, React or Vue has that for user interface components, and that's the level of compositionality people expect. We have the same thing for security when we're doing OCAP security systems and for market interaction when we're doing market-based systems. So I can provide you a concert ticket, but at the object level of abstraction, at the OCAP level of abstraction, I've handed you access to the concert ticket because I had access to you, now we both share a reference to the same concert ticket and it's a race as to which one of us gets to the door first to be able to redeem it and get in, right? Well, that's obviously not the rights transfer that you expect when you do exchange. And so we have object patterns where I can take, you know, the concert ticket came from a venue. I'm transferring the concert ticket to you. You can have an object from the venue that verifies that the concert ticket is indeed a real concert ticket and not a forgery and gives you exclusive access to the concert ticket. And so that's the standard thing that happens in business is I provide you something and you take receipt of it. 
And that taking receipt of it, it now causes it to be an exclusive transfer where the software that is taking receipt of it, which might be, you know, wallet software operating on your behalf. It might be a rich smart contract that's buying on one market and reselling on another. But fundamentally, it takes receipt of it. And now it, by construction, knows it has exclusive access. So that's the rights transfer part that is built out of simple objects at the layer below. Okay. So if I'm in Agoric ERC-20, like if I get like a message from some other object, I actually don't care who that object is. That's right. Just the fact that that other object was able to send me a message means that that object should be able to trigger XYZ with me. Mm -hmm. So the Agoric system is like, if you have an address over some object, you can trigger that object. That's right. It's a bit like if I know your home address, I can go and do stuff there. <laughs> well, not quite, because the important thing is that it is non-forgeable, right? So that's why I said the formal thing, transferable, so an object reference is transferable, unforgeable, it's not like C++ where you can take an arbitrary integer and boom, I've got a pointer to some random place in memory. It's Java or C Sharp or JavaScript where I can have an object pointer because someone handed it to me, but I can't just manufacture it out of whole cloth. To come to our location, you can manufacture an address out of whole cloth if you know some nearby building and find our location. That's not the case with objects. It's very important. So it's more unforgeable than a cryptographic token is unforgeable then a cryptographic private key is unforgeable. That relies on stochastic mathematical things to make it very unlikely that you could accidentally get it. So just assume that these things are simply unforgeable. And so an object pointer is like that. And if you've got it, you can invoke it. So if you've got it, you can invoke it and you can transfer an object reference to other objects. Exactly. But only other objects that you have rights to. So you must have a capability to another object in order to pass it a reference. And that's crucial because that's why we can create these featherweight compartments where I can run JavaScript software in and I just don't hand it the window object. And since it doesn't have the window object and it's not talking to anyone who has the window object, it's trivially to statically analyze and verify that nothing this code can do can get access to the window object. So yeah, I don't have to review this code. I know that it can't pollute my DOM or go and look in my browser UI or any of that stuff, or my wallet UI rather. I know that it's confined with respect to access to the window object because no one that I connected it to has access to the window object. So if you study this Agoric object, then just by looking at the references owned by this Agoric object, you can make statements about what this object can do. Exactly. And because you're able to make these statements, your sort of attack surface shrinks up a lot. Exactly. The security graph corresponds to the object access graph. Object access graph. And Graphs are, you know, there's a lot of things that are easy to do with graphs that are a lot harder to do with other kinds of formal methods. We care about those too, but the ability to say, okay, this subgraph can't reach anything else, so we're done, turns out to be really simplifying for lots of different kinds of security reviews. So we have this security kernel in JavaScript, various projects, MetaMask being the most relevant example for crypto, are looking at using our secure subset of JavaScript so that A, they can lock down their dependencies because those are quietly terrifying when you have hundreds of thousands of dependencies. And B, they wanna be able to take random code from random parties to be able to run inside of the wallet without exposing the private keys and other authority in a wallet. So you wanna be able to run it in a compartment, give it access to just a tiny little bit of authority and know by construction, know trivially that it's not talking to anyone that can get at any of the secrets and any of the public keys. So in a sense, like programming like an Agoric smart contract is the creation of objects. And then you give objects references to other objects and you give these references in a way that the capabilities of these individual objects are sort of limited. And that is how you can reason about the security of your system. That's right. And because you have this object capability model and then you have JavaScript, which has objects, which has references. So if you remove elements of JavaScript to just have this raw capability objects and references, then you can somehow make JavaScript secure enough for smart contracts. Exactly. So you talked about how would we do an ERC-20? The answer is we wouldn't. We'd have digital assets where you just create a JavaScript program where it has an object with operations that represents a concert ticket. And 
make it participate in, so we have these layers of protocol, if you will, so you make sure that it implements the ERTP protocol, the electronic rights transfer protocol that supports things like, you know, payments of these things and claims and stuff like that. And now it is a transferable, ownable right that you created in, you know, 20 lines of JavaScript or something. And that's what it takes to be able to have something that is donable and transferable right. And now all of the other facilities, like I want to be able to auction it off, I want to be able to exchange it with escrow, I want to be able to, you know, verify it has a minimum amount and have a return, whatever it is, those can be separate components that use this, that wrap around it, that extend it, that have an instance of this internally that they're going to update, whatever it is. And the important thing for making smart contracts happen in the world is that you can support developers at different levels of expertise and different parts of domain expertise building components in their area that are reusable by components elsewhere. If I'm going to do an art auction, I don't have to be an auction implementation expert. I want to be able to do the stack exchange or web search to say, what's the best auction for blah? And then I'm going to get this component from a place where one gets components like a you know GitHub or NPM or what have you, or whatever we end up deploying for our components and grab a well-rated auction thing and now bring my domain expertise about putting that together with how I get art and use that auction and deploy my decentralized digital art application without having had to be an expert you know, from soup to nuts on the entire thing, right? The economy is not done by, you know, what we see in Ethereum is the economy is very flat. Very few contracts are reusing other contracts. If they are, they're doing it by copying code, not by building on each other's services. And the ones that do are notable because they are exceptions, right? You know, you could probably not name more than 20 that were interesting, but there are tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of contracts that they're all very flat, they're their own independent thing. And that's not, you know, an economy is businesses being able to build on other businesses, you know, components being able to build on other components and React and Vue and Rails and all these systems of frameworks that grew into stuff that non-experts could build amazing things with happened because they could leverage the components that other people designed. And so that's a very important dynamic you need. And any system that doesn't get there, it simply doesn't have legs. So in some ways, like this object capability model, because it makes the reasoning of security easier, it is able to allow like combinations of objects to emerge more naturally than Ethereum. Exactly. That is the main hypothesis. And because combinations of objects can occur more naturally, that will be like a richer substrate for for DeFi, for, you know, freight app, you know, whatever the use cases are. And because I don't have to anticipate all of the use patterns in the creation of a new digital asset in order to produce it, it's both easier, but it's also every new contract produces new digital assets that make the ecosystem richer. In the identity-based model, Ethereum, Tezos, etc., every new contract does not necessarily produce new assets. I have to work very hard to make it something that could be reusable in other smart contract components. I have to anticipate how they compose and how it all goes together instead of having just sort of simple object-oriented patterns to be able to do that. That's the thing is you don't have to anticipate all of those use patterns in order to be able to participate in them after the fact. And so what you're doing is Agoric as a company is taking this smart contracting system. Yep. And you're building a blockchain out of it. Yep. And you're focusing specifically on the smart contracts. The rest of the blockchain, you want to borrow the technology from other experts. Right, right. The way I characterize it, we were doing smart contracts before blockchain and it was cryptographic protocols between machines where some of those were trusted by some parties, some of them were trusted by another, but fundamentally it was cryptographic protocols between machines. From our perspective, a blockchain is a machine built out of agreement rather than silicon that has vastly higher integrity, but otherwise it's just a machine. So our model has always been an execution model that can run on multiple blockchain infrastructures as well as individual machine infrastructures with a computational model that can span across them. So the computational model we have promulgated in a wide variety of areas is a familiar one now to most people. It is islands of transactional uh, um, uh, synchronous computation in a sea of asynchronous concurrency, potentially. And so we invented promises originally back in the first version of that was in 88. And that was to do high bandwidth 
pipeline messaging between independent machines be communicating about smart contracts or about cooperation kinds of secure interactions. So it's exactly the same thing here. We build on chains and between machines a protocol so that these islands of, you know, whether it's a node execution loop where it's doing transactions or a event loop in a browser where a mouse click comes in, I compute a new visual state and then go on to the next event, that model of computation fits well with asynchronous messaging between machines. In our smart contracts, you know, the message that comes in might be a bid on an auction and you compute a new state of the contract and a set of messages to be delivered to other smart contracts like, hey, transfer money from this account to that other account in order to pay off the auctioneer. But fundamentally, that message can now be delivered asynchronously and the auction there doesn't care whether it's on the same machine, on the same chain, on a different chain, on a consortium chain or a private network or what have you. So a blockchain is just a machine that is highly reliable and it is built out of agreement. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Your bigger contribution as a company is not in a specific blockchain. It is in how should we build a smart contract system and how to run it in like servers, mm -hmm. other mm -hmm. blockchains and how all of these objects could communicate with each other. Why did Agoric choose to build its own blockchain if it's just a highly reliable machine. Why do you care about building a highly reliable machine? Well, we care about building a highly reliable machine so that we can get this rich economy of cooperating components online and working. And so build its own blockchain versus be a Cosmos zone or a Polkadot parachain What's the difference? The answer is we have a highly reliable machine where we're leveraging the consensus technology that other people who have been focusing on that have been building. And it has to have particular characteristics, but we want to be able to leverage you know, the work of others, cooperate well with others, and build into those ecosystems so that all the people that are currently in those ecosystems can leverage this technology as well. But there are value in specific characteristics. There's value in the specific gas model we will choose, the scheduling architecture we will choose that will give this better legs for being able to do mainstream use cases. But we work with, we're happy if our technology gets used in a wide variety of ways. The fundamental goal of being able to deploy a blockchain that bridges to Cosmos, you know, as I said, is that a Cosmos enhancement or is its own blockchain? You know, the nice thing is, depends which hat you're wearing, but it's the same technology stack. It's the same deployment. It's just a question of perspective. We love how these different chains think about interop and are working on doing cross-chain security and all those kinds of things. That's one of the reasons we like to work so closely with them. And so from our perspective, you know, we will be rolling out a chain built on the Tendermint infrastructure initially. You know, we actually integrate the Cosmos SDK, so we may use the same staking modules that Cosmos uses. And that'll be our first chain, but that same technology stack will be able to do a consortium chain. You know, you just deploy the Cosmos infrastructure with our stuff all on top of it. We'll be able to take the rest of that technology stack, integrate it with Substrate so that we can be an infrastructure that bonds into the Polkadot ecosystem. And because of our distributed protocol, we can connect the two together. So from the point of view of a smart contract, it doesn't need to care. I mean, the deployer might, the implementer might, the owner of the DAP might, or the creator of the DAP might, but the code of the contract, it can just say, I'm taking payments in these end currencies. One of them's native, one of them's from Cosmos, and one of them's you know from Polkadot. And a fourth one is pegged Bitcoin that's brought over. And you know the auction doesn't care, and the auction may use a currency conversion mechanism that is implemented locally or is going off to Ethereum to do something or what have you. Because we fundamentally incorporate asynchronous communication into how we think about building systems. Our abstractions make that as convenient as possible. What it means is it's very easy to absorb into the typical interactions of transfer of smart contracts or payments or what have you in our programming model. It's easy to be transparent across, is it a local thing where all I have to do is update a local ledger or is it an asynchronous thing where I have to do a transfer and do a peg or what have you. All of that can be absorbed where the contract is just saying, okay, you know, pay Mahir for Quatluz for his concert ticket. And the Quatluz are on one network, they might be XRP, they might be photons, they might be dots, whatever it is, and the concert ticket might be implemented somewhere else. So what's the plan with the Agoric network? What stage is it at and when would the network go live? So in June, we deployed our first private testnet. We finished the implementation of that and implemented some very important parts of that at the Cosmos Hackathon. So it was great to be around all the experts there. But then we deployed it at the end of June and announced at ZCon 1. 
We just started on doing weekly updates of our testnet last week. So we did an update. We're doing another update today as we incrementally improve the smart contract framework. So our focus was chain integration and being able to do the end-to-end -end through the blockchain, through our secure replicated execution to JavaScript, through an initial contract model, all the way out to an ag solo machine and this to a browser. Right? And so we did all of that. Now we are focused on the contract model and evolving that to be the one that we're targeting. We will be doing successive testnet releases where we will start to add third-party validators instead of running them all ourselves. We've already got a few people that are starting to build stuff in our initial ERTP to build their own contracts. There is a challenge that came out of a discussion with Dan Robinson where he's working on a Uniswap and Markham is working on a Uniswap and then we will have a disinterested panel of judges, which is, you could you probably can't see these scare quotes in audio, but you might have heard them, to jokingly judge between those implementations. So, you know, we've got some people that are starting to build stuff. Our goal is to work with, possibly you and others, but to work with folk so that at the SF Blockchain Week in end of October, beginning of November, we will have third parties actually building stuff on our system, integrated with IBC to the Cosmos testnet as well. And so we're very excited about where that's going. We will, by the end of the year, have a more publicly accessible testnet that we can start to teach people. You know, we'll have some people building on our smart contract infrastructure in November, but we'll make that more generally accessible and visible, or well, it'll be visible, but more generally accessible, you know, by the end of the year, going out towards a main net in the middle of next year. That's an ambitious plan. It's an ambitious plan, yes. Middle of next year, well, you know, we'll, we'll see how that goes. That's something that we'll work out with the people that are building use cases on our platform to figure out what makes sense. And so we're very excited about SF Blockchain Week as being kind of a next milestone there like our testnet. So maybe in January, anybody will be able to participate in one of your testnets and deploy Agoric smart contracts. Absolutely. Cool. I'm looking forward to that day. I think like the thing that I find really exciting about Agoric is the idea that smart contracts can be written in JavaScript. It feels like such a superpower if that were to be true for the whole ecosystem. Yes, yes, yes. And let me actually correct something we said about January. So it is the case now that we are looking for a few projects to build in our smart contract platform as we go forward. It is evolving quickly, so we just want a few for the next couple of months, but that will ramp up over time. And then in January, we hope to have it just be, yeah, you know, all comers can do whatever the heck they want. But truthfully, in some sense, it will be up to the testnet validators at that point of which we'll run some of them, but there's a good chance that it will be other validators are doing that. But between now and heading towards FSF Blockchain Week, we absolutely want to work with projects that are excited about this to start building stuff on the platform, whether it's at the low level or whether it's leveraging ERTP in our contract framework. Both of those are interesting. And so we're gradually starting to talk to projects between now and then and look at things to support. And it's just a matter of being able to tolerate change and what our support bandwidth is leading up to that. I'm looking forward to the launch of both SF blockchain week and the launch of the testnet i'll hopefully be at sf and it was great to have a chat with you dean and i look forward to the releases and news from Ogori. excellent well thank you for having us here thank you for the interesting work that you're doing on staking and other kinds of designs because that's the sort of stuff that really contributes value to not just our project but lots of other projects so i think the podcast here is great and the other research work that you guys are doing are great so i'm delighted to be here thank you Thank you for listening to the Chorus One podcast. Visit chorus.one for more information about our work. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast to stay tuned on new episodes airing every Monday.